Hi, my name is Michelle Succo, and today I'm going to start off some of the talks on the sandy beaches. Today I'm going to present specifically on the surf perch or the surf zone fish side of things. So first I'm going to give you a quick outline of what I'm going to cover today. So first I'm going to go over the overall project goals for the sandy beach project <coughs> and then go into more specifically some of the questions that the surf zone fish had. Uh, then I'm going to go over our focal species, the red tailed surf perch. Then I'm going to go over the methods on how we gathered all of our fish. Next, I'll go over some of our key findings from the data that we gathered on these fish. And then lastly, I'm going to review how these key findings relate back to our overall project questions. So first, going over the project goals. <laughs> That's my advisor, Tim Mulligan. Um, so uh, the Sandy Beach had two main overarching goals. The first question, was, or the first goal that we had was to provide a comprehensive regional characterization of the sandy beach ecosystems, and that includes the surf zone and the surf zone fishes. Secondly, we wanted to provide recommendations for future marine protected area monitoring. So um, after all this data is collected, we want to make sure that we can provide future, um, or sorry, uh, recommendations for when people monitor these beaches in the future. To, in order to do these, we had to collect a variety of data, and we collected data on um, the abundance and diversity of macroinvertebrates, fishes, and birds. We also collected information on the physical and biological elements of the system, so that includes information on the sand of the beach, the wave action, and also the algae and rack getting washed up on the shore. We also collected information on the activities of people and dogs, so whether there were people walking on the beach as well as people uh, surfing in the surf zone. And there uh, will be, like Eve said, a talk later in the session, or I think the second session, um, where Jenny Dugan will talk about all these. Um, however, I'm gonna focus on just the surf zone fishes. So um, first, let's go over the project questions that we had for the surf zone fishes. First is, what are the characteristics of our Northern California surf perch populations? So to answer that question, we had to collect a bunch of data on the surf perch in our region. Our next question was, are our reference sites comparable to our marine protected area sites? That's important to know, so at this very beginning where these marine protected areas were just established, we want to know if our reference sites are actually comparable to our marine protected areas so we can compare it in the future. And next, our third question was, are these a good indicator species for future monitoring? Are we gonna want to continue to monitor, monitor these species in order to see if there's going to be some kind of effect that these marine protected areas have. And a little bit of a spoiler, I'm going to give you some of our results to just to explain why we used red tail surf perch as an indicator species, or sorry, as a focal species. So over the two years of our study, we caught 909 surf perch. Of those 909, 24 were silver surf perch, and the remaining 885 were red tail surf perch. And that was over the full two years of study. Um, so given those results, we decided to focus on red tail surf perch. Um, and for that, they were our focal species. So red tail surf perch, scientific name is Amphistigus rhodoteris. Many of you probably recognize this surf perch. It is the primary surf perch taken by recreational anglers in the North Coast region. There's also a small commercial fishery for this species, and the largest landings come out of the port of Eureka. These fish utilize the surf zone um, in, next to sandy beaches as forage areas, so they come up close to shore and they feed on the different prey sources that are available to them. And after my talk, Helen Mulligan is going to give a talk on the diet of these fish. This was truly a collaborative project. Many people from different organizations and groups came together to collect these fish. So we have people from Humboldt State University. We also have people from the California Beach Fishermen's Association. Um, we have these two great people from the Talladega Nation, Rosen J. Tuck, and um, Kat Crane from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Many, there were also many HSU volunteers that came out and helped, and the majority of these were HSU undergraduate students in the fisheries department. So methods, we overall had nine sandy beaches that we went and sampled at. And this ranged all the way up from the California-Oregon border down to Mendocino. Four of these sites were marine protected areas and the remaining five were reference sites. So for each marine protected area, there was one associated reference site, except for at Samoa Dunes here close to Eureka. 
Um, we added a second reference site for this marine protected area, and that was only because it's so close to Humboldt State University, we were able to get out and sample more often. So we figured, why not add a second site? This was probably the most fun um, for the methods going out and collecting. We just went out on the beach and tried fishing with hook and line. So going out on the beach with your fishing pole, casting out into the surf zone, and trying to catch some fish. In 2014, we sampled six of the nine sites between June and October, and they were sampled three times each. The reason it was only six of the nine sites is because three of the sites had not yet been added to the study at this time. And then in 2015, we sampled all of the nine sites, three to eight times each between April and November. We added more months to the sampling just to get, and get a better picture of the abundance over the year. And they were sampled three to eight times each. Um, that variability is due to ease of access to the different sites as well as weather conditions. For each site, we tried to gather information on the abundance of the red tail surf perch, the lengths, sex ratios, and movement. And to gather information on movement, we tagged the fish with T-bar tags. And that's what this little, these little yellow bars are in this picture. So um, I'm going to go over our key findings today. And they're going to relate to these four um, for types of data that we are collecting. So now to go over our key findings. Um, first, I wanted to make sure everybody knows that the data that I'm going to show you is pooled across the two years. So I'm not going to show it broken up by years. I'm just going to show you all the data for the two years. And first, looking at relative abundance. So here on our y-axis, we have mean catch per unit effort. That's calculated by the number of fish we caught in a particular day divided by how many hours went into catching those fish. On the x-axis, we have all of our sites ranging from north to south. The ones with the boxes around them are the marine protected areas, and the sites with the similar colors, those are the marine protected areas and their associated reference sites. So what we can see across the board here is that um, they're all pretty close to this one fish per hour. And also when you take a look at the marine protected areas and their associated reference sites, none of them are significantly different from one another, with one exception and that is this South Samoa dune site. We caught significantly lower or fewer fish per hour at the South Samoa dune site than South Samoa dunes. So what this might indicate to us is that the South Samoa dune site is not as good of a reference site um, than this Mad River site is for Samoa dunes. Next, looking at length frequency. Of, so this is just the, how frequently we caught fish of different sizes. So on the y-axis this time, we have frequency, or how often we caught the fish. And the x-axis this time is the total length of the fish. This is in millimeters, and total length, we measure that by measuring from the snout of the fish all the way to the tip of the tail, or the caudal fin. And what we can see from this figure is that the range is from 140 to about 420 millimeters in size. But as you can see from the shape of this graph, that the average is around 260 millimeters, which is about a 10-inch fish. We can break this down by site over the two years. And so this time, mean length in millimeters on the y-axis, and once again, sites going across the x-axis. And wow, those are all very similar, right? Um, there's hardly any variation across all the sites. So what we can get from this is that our reprotected areas and our reference sites are not significantly different once again. These are all very comparable sites. <coughs> Next, looking at our sex ratios. So this time, sex ratios on the y-axis, where we say uh, this shows the percent that are males and the percent that are females. This red line going across is our 50-50 mark, so half males, half females. I want to make it clear that the bars indicate male and female, so the lower, darker portion are the males, and the upper, lighter portion are the females. So what we can see here is that pretty much across the board, though there is some vari slight variation away from it, a lot of the sites are pretty close to that 50-50 mark. So across all of the North Coast region, we're seeing about half female, half male red tail surf perch. What is different about this um, from the other data we collected is that our marine protected areas and reference sites, all of them are significantly different, though. With the one exception is that Samoa and um, South Samoa dunes are almost identical. Mm -hmm. 
Next, looking at movement. So over the two years, we were able to deploy 504 tags. And here is what a tag looks like in a fish. So it's this little plastic bar coming off the top of the fish. And um, after two years of deploying tags, to this day, we have five tag returns. Um, here's a table showing our returns. So our far column is the site from which the tag was deployed. The middle column shows the days at liberty, so how long the fish was back in the water before it was caught again. And you can see that ranged from 13 days to almost a year. Um, and then the far column is distance travel, so how far that fish went. So we know, sorry, um, we know where they were deployed from, and we also know where the fish was caught again, so we're able to estimate about how far that fish traveled. And you can see that ranged from three kilometers to 18 kilometers. Just wanted to go over some possible reasons as to why we had such low tag returns. First is poor tag retention. So it's possible that once we release the fish back out into the water, the tag just fell right off. It's also possible that, there, that our tags caused premature death. So when we were inserting the tag, for some reason we might have injured the fish. Or it also could be that this yellow tag sticking out of a fish is a marker for a predator to come and eat it. Um, there's also, it's also possible that there was just low reporting of tags. So it could be that an angler caught a fish and either didn't see that there was a tag on it, or it could also be that they just chose not to report their finding. It's also possible that, um, as many of you know, up here in the North Coast region, there's some beaches that are just really hard to get to. And so because of this restricted access, if the fish are choosing to go to these beaches, it just might not be that they're accessible to us to catch. There was a study done in, done in Southern Oregon that looked at the effects of these same tags on red tail surfers, and they found that poor tag retention and premature death were not a factor. So we also believe for our study that these were not reasons for hard low tag returns. But given all of this, these results may indicate the movement is relatively local. I say may here just because we're going off of five tag returns. But um, despite being at liberty for 13 or almost a full year, these fish traveled less than 20 kilometers. So they stayed pretty close. So now just to review, um, looking at our results compared to our project questions. The first question that we had was, what are the characteristics of Northern California surf perch populations? And to answer that question, we were able to collect information on the abundance, length, sex ratios, and movement. And we saw pretty much across the board that all of our sites at this point are very similar. And that's something that you would expect having the MPAs just recently being established. We still believe that we need more information on movement um, since we only have five tag returns at this time. <coughs> the next question we had was, are our reference sites comparable to our marine protected area sites? And that was an over, like, overwhelming yes. Um, as you can see from a lot of those figures, there's very little variability at this time. And our reference sites in particular were very comparable to our marine protected areas in that they weren't significantly different. The only time this wasn't true was for sex ratios. And lastly, are these a good indicator species for future monitoring? At the beginning of this project, it was discussed as to whether we should use surf perch as an indicator species, just because they have relatively low economic value and they appear to be really abundant in this region. So should we actually monitor them? And we believe actually, yes, though, we should, especially for monitoring of marine protected areas for a couple of reasons. First, um, as you can see from our data, across the board in the North Coast region, our populations of surf perch or red tailed surf perch are very similar, especially with respect to how many fish you can catch and what sizes are available. We also found that they're relatively local, or they may be, and what that might mean is that if there is some kind of local impact in our North Coast region, we should be able to see that impact reflected in our North Coast red tailed surf perch populations if indeed they are staying relatively local. And lastly, like I had mentioned before, there's uh, many sites or many beaches in the North Coast region that are really hard to gain access to, and those can serve as potential refuges for these fish from fishing mortality. <coughs> um, what that means is that if for some reason fishing mortality isn't the biggest driver affecting these fish populations, then we might be able to detect other drivers that are affecting these fish, especially in our marine protected areas and reference sites. And with that, I'd like to thank all of the data collectors and the co-authors and contributors and my funding sources, and um, I'll take any questions. And thank you for listening. Yes. Um, did you, uh, in your protocol, set up fishing on the same tide, or was it done on the same time? Did you 
do any fishing at night as well as during the day? It was always during the day, and we tried to go at specific tides. Um, and we would always try and go at the high tide, I believe it was. It's been two years, I'm trying to remember. I think it was higher, it was higher low. Which one was the low? High. Um, if you look back at your catch, like catch on a given day data, do you see any evidence for segregation between male and female surf perch? I had a feeling that question was coming. So yes, yeah, so a lot of the people that came out and helped sampling, we would ask them afterwards if they felt that there was a difference. Uh, once we went to a particular site on a particular day, did you feel like we were catching more males or more females? And they felt that was the case. So <coughs> the way we sampled was we would fish at a particular spot until we stopped catching fish and then we move on. So we were definitely fishing little pockets of schools of fish and we felt that those were generally um, all male or all female, or mostly male, mostly female. So that definitely influenced those results that we got. You mentioned there's another tagging study in Oregon. Um, what were their findings regarding movement? Uh, movement, they showed actually much more movement. Um, they also had way more tags than we did. Um, they found that they some of the fish moved down actually into our region, um, but they found generally that they did not like to swim past any kind of land barrier. So that might limit the fish in, uh, for example, this region, they might like to stay locally just because we do have um, that Cape, what is it, Cape Mendocino, <laughs> that they don't want to swim past. But they found something um, similar, but they did travel further. Yeah. Are you considering abundance um, being tied to uh, sand crabs? Because as a recreational fisherman, probably five years ago, it was hard to find sand crabs and then hard to find a like, tail perch. But now, the sand crabs have come back with a huge abundance of them and there seems to be fish everywhere. They're definitely related and if you stay for the next talk, I think you'll find out how important they are for these fish. Helen will definitely talk about that. And the later Sandy Beach talk is going to go over, they're going to show you a figure on how the red tail catch is related to the abundance of the sand crabs. So yes, very much so. Do you want to get last question in the back? Uh, thank you. I apologize I was late. You may have already answered this. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned since I've been here about uh, access <coughs> limitations. And specifically at Redwood National <coughs> Park, at the access that was cut off from commercial fishermen that was put into the marine protected area. Do you have any specific data related to that? Um, I'm not sure what he's talking about. Jim, do you know where? He's talking about the access up towards Gold Bluffs, I think. Oh, uh, near Gold Bluffs Beach? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, Tim. Well, yeah, the access has been cut off. Certainly, and we know that there are good populations of fish out there, that's for sure. Yeah, really. Good story. Sorry. I guess that's it. <laughs>